uh, call meeting to order and can I welcome everyone to this the seventh meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019. We have two items on the agenda this morning, consideration of one new petition and three continuing petition. It's my intention, however, to begin with petition two and we will go back to first petition um, after we've dealt with the continuing petitions. So the first continued petition for our consideration this morning is petition 1678 on a national strategic framework for countryside ranger services in Scotland, lodged by Ranger Robert Reid on behalf of the Scottish Countryside Rangers Association. The clerk's note provides a summary of the submissions received since our last consideration of this petition back in October 2018. The Scottish Government repeats its acknowledgement of the services that Scotland's Rangers provide but that its position has not changed insofar as it still believes that it is a matter for local authorities as to how they distribute funds. In response to the committee's specific question on the use of returns and reports from local authorities to provide an overall picture of the level of ranger services throughout Scotland, the government says that while such reports are, can be useful, local authorities are under no obligation to gather and collate such information. In its submission, Scottish Natural Heritage provides a full note of the meeting of the Rangers Development Partnership held in January 2019. It refers to that meeting as positive, with much lively discussion. It adds that at a subsequent meeting with COSLA, it was agreed that there is a need to raise awareness of the profile of ranger services in local authorities. It considers that, rather than focusing on the impact of individual budget decisions, the profile of ranger services can be improved by looking at the benefits provided by those services across a range of local authority activities. Scottish Natural Heritage refers to a positive meeting held between its chair and the Scottish Countryside Rangers Association, which concentrated on ways to move rangering forward. This included, includes a 2030 vision to look, quote, beyond the current period of significant change, budget uncertainty, uh, unquote, with a further meeting to be held early next year to review progress. SNH states that over the course of the next 12 months, it will work with the Rangers Association and the Ranger Development Partnership to refresh the policy framework for rangering in Scotland. Review options to, for reporting on ranger services and the benefits they provide, coordinate the development of a training and development programme and support the establishment of new junior ranger programmes. The petitioner on behalf of the Scottish Countryside Rangers Association has also provided a further submission. That submission is identified in the clerk's note, sets out the SCRA's aspirational outcomes from this petition, including a working group to identify any reasons for what it refers uh, to as a, quote, significant decline in ranger service posts, an update of the strategic framework, which is at the core of the petition, and to secure future funding of ranger services. That submission makes clear that the SCRA does not consider SNH to be a suitable agency to lead any working group, and adds that it believes that Ranger Development Partnership does not carry sufficient authority and lacks the clear leadership required to look objectively at the various issues. Paragraph 12 of the Clark's note identifies other issues of concern highlighted by the SCRA. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Convener. I think it's, it's um, a matter of concern that uh, uh, the SCRA don't have a lot of confidence in SNH, um, but that's, you know, possibly understandable given the, the history of the the, the issue. Um, it's also a bit concerning that uh, COSLA didn't manage to get along to um, one of the meetings that was arranged, although uh, they do seem to be engaging uh, now um, with regard to uh, preparing a paper um, with SNH on, on the future of ranger services. Um, but I think, you know, there's a wider issue here and, and it's, it's captured by the, by the rangers themselves when they uh, have issued in, uh, mentioned in the past the issue of, of preventative spend. And, and I think that's an issue that uh, the whole of the parliament and government should be looking at in the future. And, you know, the, the demise of the ranger service it certainly seems to be counterproductive when it comes to preventative spend. So um, I'd be keen, convener, to uh, uh, perhaps set up a, a round table mm -hmm. and ask uh, all the stakeholders in to 
um, look for you know to discuss a way forward uh, at some point in the not too distant future. Okay. Um, anyone else? Rachel? I agree with Angus because um, if the SR SCRA believe that um, SNH are not suitable to run the working group, I think we need to give SNH the opportunity to uh, respond to that and also for other stakeholders to then respond, particularly COSLA, uh, about the funding, uh, about the postcode lottery um, and about the way that there are uh, range of posts um, still not filled at the moment. And uh, there are lots and lots of questions, and there's some um, really informative submissions from a number of people. But I think we need to drill down uh, with bringing those people in together. Yeah. I, mean, I was quite struck by, um, I think there's an acknowledgement of this significant decline, but you know, the Scottish government saying, but well, it still should be a matter for local authorities, and I think that's problematic. And there was actually just a small point about the. Um, small, you know, introductory jobs around rangers people could could do, which are then allowed a career path, but they're saying there's now not a career path for folk, so that in itself must create further decline in, in, in the longer term. Are we agreed then that we should um, look at doing a, a round table, and it would afford the opportunity, I think, to really to kind of explore what the, what the job is, why it's important, why there are challenges to it being sustained, and if there's to be a, a group that's going to bring folk together, who would be the lead in that? If it's not SNH, it would be useful to, to establish that. Is that agreed, yeah. uh, Angus? Yeah, certainly agreed, convener. Um, and, and I would hope that the COSLA would be included in the round table, but could we also try and identify a local authority that still has support for, for Rangers and, and ask them to join the round table uh, and give us a, a positive spin on, yes. uh, on, on, on the job? Okay. Just, just as a, 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 a sub note to that, is, is I think that I totally understand the, the government position saying that it is, is the responsibility of the local authorities, but surely they, they still must have a, an interest in understanding what's going on mm -hmm. uh, at, at that level, because it, it can't just be pushed to one side and, and allowed to decline in that way. I think I, I would sure that the, the Scottish government do have an interest in, in, in this. Certainly, in, in, in their submission, they do make clear they do value the service, but they're, they're still saying, but having handed this over to local government, they want it to be determined at a local government level. Um, and there's a logic to that, but if the consequence to that is that it's, it's not sustainable in the longer term, I think there's a problem. So I think if we can agree to take evidence and we can, um, um, in a roundtable format, we allow that kind of dialogue, that would be very useful. Rachel? Convene it. Uh, do we need to sort of agree who we're bringing in? Because I, I did also notice that um, National Trust for Scotland and um, Historic Environment Scotland were mentioned within this, within the rebranding exercise, which is an important part of the inconsistency. What, what, what we'll do is, um, with the clerks, we'll get a, a, a suggested list of people to come along, and, we, and with your permission, um, I'll take the authority to, to do that, to make sure we get that broad range of people who are available um, and willing to participate. So if that's agreed, we can move on to the next continuing petition, um, which is petition 1698 on medical care in rural areas, lodged by Karen Murphy, Jane Rento, David Wilkie, Louisa Rogers and Jennifer Jane Lee. And can I welcome Rhoda Grant for consideration of this petition. At a previous consideration of this petition on 22nd November 2018, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government and the Scottish Rural Parliament. Members will be aware that these submissions have been received alongside the petitioner's response from Karen Murphy. Issues have been raised with regards to the remote and rural GP working group about its transparency and the scope of its work. We have recently received correspondence about a troubling development that has taken place, whereby the Vice Chair of the Rural GP Association of Scotland, RGPAS, has resigned from the working group. Quote, it's a committed decision that I should resign from the SLWG, the working group, and for R RGPAS to withdraw from further um, working group work. We need to see more tangible and convincing commitment to addressing the issues affecting our members in our rural communities in Scotland. Despite the questions asked and the submissions that have been received, there are still a number of issues that require further scrutiny, namely issues relating to the calculation of the Scottish workload allocation formula and the implications of the new GP contract. 
The most recent submissions from the Scottish Government states the background and intentions of the new um, Scottish workload allocation formula, but the specific issues raised by the petitioners are not addressed sufficiently. This lack of clarity appears to be the case on this issue and the other issues raised by the petitioners. And you will note that um, for general questions today relating to this topic, we have questions from Gail Ross to ask the Scottish Government what steps it plans to take to re-engage the Rural GP Association with its remote and rural general practice work, working group and Donald Cameron to ask the Scottish Government what action is taken to support GP practices in rural areas. Um, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? The, um, the uh, Health and Sport Committee are doing uh, quite a, a, a piece of work around, uh, around uh, the GP contract. And uh, it just so happened last week we had um, a sort of rural um, NHS board in and asked, asked a specific question around you know, the acceptance of uh, the GP contract, how that's been um, uh, 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 you know, accepted by the, 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 the GPs. And they weren't quite so candid as I'd like them to be, but they, what they did say was that there's only although 70 per cent of respondents to the GP contract were positive. It was 70 per cent or 30 per cent. So only 30 per cent of GPs actually um, replied. And the, the inference seems to be that uh, there, is, there is an issue around the GP contract in the rural area. Um, so, well, I would, I would I think, think it'd be, it would be good to get the Cabinet Secretary in to, uh, uh, to, to ask her opinion on this, but also, I think, cross-referencing with the work that's been done in the Health and Sport Committee, I think, would, 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 uh, would certainly help. OK. Can I ask Rhoda Grant to come in at this point? So obviously, you've been maybe working with the campaigners, and then I'll bring other folk in. Yes, um, as you know, convener, I cover the Highlands and Islands, and this is a really big issue in, in my area because there are a lot of rural GPs. Now, I don't have the figures with me, but I understand that there was polling done of rural GPs and how many had supported the contract, and that was a very low number. Indeed, most were against the new contract. Um, it doesn't recognise the differences of how people operate in rural areas. There might be a larger number of home visits, for example, because they're people keeping people out of hospital. Um, rather than have elderly people sent away, they have much more um, hands-on caring. And that's true when GPs are responsible for local hospitals, such as Campbelltown, Goldsby, and places like that. Um, they have that additional um, work that is not recognised in the, the contract. And I think it's very specialist work as well. And the way the contract has been drawn up has really impacted on the morale of rural GPs who often work above and beyond um, and therefore don't feel valued at all. And it also flies in the face of what I think we all recognised as issues um, with health inequalities in, in that it hasn't worked for rural areas and neither has it worked for um, deprived urban areas. Um, it looks at the number of, I think, appointments available and it also looks at the age profile of of uh, patients in a practice now we all know in deprived areas there can be a 10 year um, life expectancy gap which actually means that deprived areas get less because their their patients don't live as long as other areas so it seems to have moved funding in the opposite direction to where it was understood that funding needed to move so to that extent, I think the whole contract needs looked at, but it certainly does need looked at um, with regard to rural GPs because we struggle to fill those posts and if the contract goes unchanged or without an addition that deals with rural practice, then I think we'll see that getting worse and the cost of locums is extremely high for, for rural health boards. Okay, Rachel? Um, this does seem to be a disagreement between um, the Scottish Government's uh, submission in which they stated that the new formula um, gives greater weight to older pa patients and uh, deprivation. So, uh, I mean, I represent a rural constituency as well, and I think it's concerning, first of all, the number of GPs that have um, fed into the Health and Sport Committee, but also the high level of people who are uh, dissatisfied um, with 
with, with the um, Scottish workload allocation formula. So I do think there's a disagreement here between what the uh, petitioner is saying and what the Scottish Government is saying. Um, I, I, I think that we do need to uh, tease that out somehow. Okay. I mean, certainly, my recollection of our last discussion, it's certainly the kindest, it's counterintuitive to have more money coming into the system and it takes money out of poor communities and it takes it out of rural areas. Um, and I don't know whether it takes account of, if you count it by appointments, we know that in more deprived areas, people bring more problems with them. So there may be comorbidities, there may be other issues that they bring as well as the, the presenting problem. And I was also very struck by the petitioner's submission, like expressing a frustration that actually some of the, the very significant questions they were flagging up were simply not answered in the Scottish Government's um, submission. There seems to be a process issue, um, and I don't pretend to understand it properly, but the fact that they call it the technical advisory group on resource allocation was not consulted, which would be the normal process. And the question is why? And I think that's the kind of thing we would want to explore. Um, I do think it would be useful to bring the Cabinet Secretary in, and I hear what Brian is saying about looking at the, the contract, but it looks as if there's a specific issue about a subset of those who are um, you know, GPs, which is the rural GPs, for example, you know, in a, in a big practice in a city, you will have other staff that can do various different things for you. You don't have to do them, but in a, in a rural practice, there's not going to necessarily be the folk with that. The, the range of people who could do those um, other jobs for you, so it obviously increases the pressure on you. I think and they do flag up this whole question about rural proofing, which I was quite interested in how that actually feeds itself into government, so government understands what rural proofing actually is, or you know, I mean, the island proofing. What does it actually mean in practical terms when you're making that kind of decision, when you're making a provision for a service right across Scotland? How do you make sure that, in my case, deprived urban areas as opposed to all urban areas, rural areas, um, and remote and fragile areas, how are they factored in as well? So I think there's, I, I got a very strong, well, two things. The fact that the, the short life working group was not allowed to revisit the contract um, in itself wasn't responding to the, the, the question the petitioner was raising. Um, but that, that secondly, they feel that their questions have not been answered. I think that's quite a big issue there. Right. Just, just to follow on from what you said there, can be from what Ronnie Grant said. I think one of the other things that is uh, early in, in the investigation, what was obviously coming out, is, is the likelihood of, um, as you say, a, a, G, a, a rural GP having that team around them, having a physio, having a mental health expert, having a you know, a, a, you know, a pharmacy around them, is is much less likely than in an urban area. Um, and uh, that, that, without question, uh, there's a big disparity there, and I think that the, the contract itself uh, is, is not addressing that. I think so. It would be good, good to get the cabinet. I suppose the other question would, I would raise would be that even if it were special pleading, which obviously, if people are negotiating, they're going to make their case. If the consequence is that we're not attracting people into to rural areas, the GPs will get a major problem. And some of the submissions, I think, make that point very strongly too, because it then has consequences for the sustainability of those communities. It does make that point in saying that there is limited reassurance and um, there could be knock-on effects in, in terms of recruitment and retaining uh, GPs. And we're already experiencing that in rural practices where um, GPs have their lists, um, patient lists have actually increased because the number of uh, GPs that they're attracting is, um, well, in some circumstances non-existent. And if we have a philosophy of primary care without necessarily jumping immediately to acute services, then that's also important that that GP provision is sustainable. Angus? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, thanks, Convener. We, we, we shouldn't forget, um, of course, that there were significant uh, concerns from rural GPs even before mm -hmm. uh, the, the contracts were introduced. Um, so given the, uh, you know, continued concerns that have been raised not only by the, the petitioner, um, including you know, not just concerns but frustrations, uh, but also by the Rural GP Association of Scotland who have stated in their submission 
that there are serious concerns that the GP contract is not fit for purpose uh, in rural communities. Um, there are uh, quite a number of questions that need to be answered mm -hmm. by the government, um, and I think we should uh, consider inviting the Cabinet Secretary in to give evidence on, on this specific issue. Okay. Any final points, Rona? Rhoda? Just, just um, a point you made yourself, but just to emphasise it about the working group. The working group was set up to sort this out. Now, if the people that are on the working group have no confidence that that's going to happen, then I think it's important to bring that to the attention of the Cabinet Secretary and see where we can go um, to make sure that the problem is solved. OK, so in, in that case, um, we're agreeing that we do invite the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport to provide evidence to the committee and the matters raised um, and the submissions received today. And I think we would hope to do that speedily because we realise that this is a, an ongoing issue and as long as it's not resolved, it's going to have consequences for the broader health provision in, in, uh, in rural areas. OK, um, and can I thank... Roger Grant for her att attendance. If we move on to our final um, continuing petition for consideration today, which is petition 1705, lodged by Alec Milne. The petition calls for a review of legislation relating to investigation of and penalties applicable to wildlife crime in Scotland. The clerk's note refers to the Scottish Government's submission in which it states that it intends to bring forward legislation to increase penalties relating to wildlife crime. The petitioner has welcomed this intention and has indicated that he would respond to any consultation the government brings forward to inform any primary or secondary legislation. The petitioner has also provided what he considers to be potential solutions to the current difficulties in presenting video evidence in the context of wildlife crime. He notes that these challenges were recently discussed as part of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's consideration of the Wildlife Crime Annual Report 2017. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus. Okay, thanks, um, Convener. Uh, yeah, the petitioner rightly highlights the, the issue of video evidence. Um, as a member of the Eclair Committee, if, uh, we've been looking at this issue for uh, some time, and, and there, there has been video evidence that has been has not been used uh, for you know, various reasons, but it, it's concerning that it can be used as, as evidence. But I think, um, given that the Eclair Committee uh, recently took evidence on the, the, the Wildlife Crime Annual Report for 2017, because we're always kind of a, a year or, or sometimes two years behind on, on the annual reports, um, and the, you know, given that the issue of wildlife crime has been very much on the Eclair Committee's uh, radar since the committee was formed, and also its predecessor committee, the Raki Committee, took the, the issue extremely seriously. I think there's, um, there's a good argument to uh, refer the petition at this point to the Eclair Committee so that it can uh, uh, give um, the time and concentration to it that uh, it, it perhaps deserves. Okay. Any other views? Everybody is um, ag um, agreeing then that we would um, we want to thank the petitioner for the very uh, substantial response he provided um, for the consideration of this petition, but we would agree to refer the petition <coughs> to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee for its consideration as part of its um, ongoing work in relation to wildlife crime and for any potential scrutiny of relevant legislation in this session. Is that agreed? And um, we want to thank the petitioner I think there has been um, significant progress made as a consequence of the petition, and obviously um, he'll be able to uh, follow the, the consideration of the, um, the committee in its work as it continues to look at this issue. Um, and can I uh, suspend briefly?
Um, if I call the meeting back to order, and can we now turn to um, the consideration of a new petition? And this new petition is Petition 1716, which calls for a full review of mental health service provision across the NHS in Scotland to ensure that policy and practice is delivered consistently across the country. And I can I welcome Monica Lennon to the meeting for this item. This petition was lodged by Karen McKeown and Gillian Murray. The background information explains the circumstances which led to the petition. Members will also be aware that those circumstances have been addressed here in the Parliament at First Minister's questions and have also received significant media coverage. The note prepared by Spice and the Clarks provides some data and statistics and outlines the range of strategies and action plans being taken forward by the Scottish Government. Members will recall that at our last meeting we took evidence from the Minister for Mental Health and at that meeting the Minister restated her announcement of the independent overarching review of the Mental Health Act and incapacity legislation. For our consideration of this petition today, we will take evidence from one of the petitioners, Karen McKeown. And can I thank you for attending this morning, Karen, and want to welcome you. And uh, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes. Yeah, um I'd like to thank the Ministers for, get, for considering our position and for giving me the opportunity to be here today. I'd also like to thank the sympathetic and caring support by the petition clerks during this process. Luke was my best friend. He was my partner. He was my rock and soulmate. He was a devoted father to our two wonderful children. Luke was a hard-working, kind and generous person. Tragically, he took his own life, and I feel this was a preventable death. During December 2017, Luke began to act totally out of character. I started to notice that he'd become mentally unwell and I was desperately concerned for his safety. He began to have visual and audio hallucinations. He was unable to sleep and that lasted over three weeks. I became more and more concerned that I was unable to keep him safe and he was unable to keep himself safe. One day, Luke left the house. When he returned, he was acting very odd. Luke Luke told me that the voices in his head were going to kill him, like murder, and it would be put down to suicide. My concerns grew, and Luke agreed for me to call the NHS 24. They advised me, if I was concerned for my own safety, to call the police or take Luke to accident emergency. I took, I, the first time I took Luke to accident emergency was on the 29th of December 2017. Between the 20, 23rd of December and the 29th of December, we tried in vain to get help from the hospital on two occasions, the CPNs and addiction, also addiction services. I begged every service to help us or point us in the right direction of support or even just to give him medication to ease his symptoms. Every time we were turned away and abandoned. I also, I also called the NHS 24 on a further three occasions. We also had the added issue of Luke being removed from his GP practice prior that year. I phoned every GP surgery within our area and asked them to help us and begged for appointments. I even begged my own GP surgery to take Luke on as a temporary patient. But as it was the Christmas holidays, no practice was taking new patients on at this time. Every professional I spoke to, I made very clear my concerns that Luke was planning to end his life. Time after time, I pleaded for help, begging. I knew, I knew by Luke's odd behaviour, he was unable to keep himself safe any longer and my concerns just grew. Every time we were dismissed and turned away. On the 29th of December, 2017, I woke at 2 a.m. to find Luke hanging from my stairs, feet away from where our children were sleeping. The events of that night has shattered my world. I will relive that memory for the rest of my life. It will never leave me. My children has been left without a father to care and guide them throughout their lives. Me and my children, our wider family and local community has felt this loss. After Luke's tragic death, I made a formal complaint. I was shocked to read that in their findings that they said Luke showed no signs of mental illness and was not suicidal. The report concluded that staff had followed the correct procedures, even though on every occasion I dealt with professional, I voiced serious concerns of Luke being suicidal. Once again, I was told correct procedure was followed, not admitting Luke to hospital. If that was the case, I ask if current procedures are fit for purpose. I also ask why a fatal accident inquiry is not automatically carried out to ensure that lessons are learned. I'd like to see a review of the mental health service to, to ensure consistency and quality over NHS. 
Luke's case is not unique, far from it. The same failures are happening up and down the country. Lessons must be learned. Crisis support needs to be available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Most importantly, family concerns must be listened to and not dismissed. We understand those we live with. We know when there's something just not right. Nothing I can do will ever bring Luke back. It's my duty to Luke as his partner and mother to his children that I continue to campaign for change. We urgently need a mental health service that is fit for purpose. I need to look my children in the eye and tell them that their dad did not die in vain. Luke's legacy will prevent other families going through such horrendous pain and distress as we, go, as we all have went through and continue to do so. We need action and for now, and this is for, this is for everyone who has lost their life to suicide, including Luke. very much for that. That's very much appreciated. Gillian Murray, Karen's co-petitioner, is not able to attend today's meeting, but has provided a statement which has been circulated in members and with her permission, which I will read out for the record. Most of us are aware of David Ramsey's story. David Ramsey, my uncle, was failed by NHS Tayside and took his own life following a breakdown which resulted in psychosis. Despite three suicide attempts in four days, David was sent home after a second emergency assessment at Caresview Centre and consequently took his own life. Thankfully, the Scottish Parliament listened to me last year and inquiries underway into NHS Tayside mental health services due to the sheer volume of similar cases to David's. What has struck me from my campaigning is that these mental health failures, while they seem to be more concentrated at NHS Tayside, are not unique to Tayside. The same failures are repeated throughout Scotland and most concernedly, no lessons ever seem to be learned. I do not want another family to go through this pain. I do not want to become another statistic myself. I cannot be there in person today because I am now unwell due to the NHS failures which cost my uncle his life. I have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. The impact on my life has been enormous. I have had zero help from the NHS despite working and paying into the system other than a repeat prescription of medication. How can it be acceptable that my uncle was failed and now I am being failed? Why are no lessons been learned? Why is the ripple effect allowed to continue? Why is it a postcode lottery whether you have access to a mental health service that is fit for purpose? Why are bereaved families having to campaign and fight for parity of esteem and for justice? It cannot be right that a prisoner who takes their life in jail receives an automatic fatal accident inquiry, yet patients under the care of the NHS are taking their lives in a secure psychiatrist ward, yet no fatal accident inquiry takes place. And we would want to thank um, Gillian for that statement. If we can now move um, to some questions, just really to explore some of the issues, Karen, that you have, have, have highlighted. Um, and then we'll look at what we want to do with the, pe the petition. And we do appreciate just how difficult this is for you and how um, personal it is for you. Um, you obviously highlighted some of the things that have already been done and the fact that um, Monica Lennon raised the, this at First Minister's questions. And there's been some uh, reporting of what's happened in the media. And I know that people will be familiar with the background of your petition. You indicated that you had a meeting with the Minister for Mental Health, and I wonder if you want to say a little about that, when that meeting was, um, and has, that, has there been a follow-up to that? I met with the Minister. It was early in October last year. Um, she listened, like, listened to like what I've just kind of told you, but that was all she done. There was no follow-up. There was no action. There was no... Nothing else came out of that meeting apart from the minister listening to me, um, and that, that, that's all I can really say about that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brian Whittle. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for, your, uh, for giving us your evidence. In, in your petition, you, you stated that you, your loved ones asked for help a, a number of times, um, and you added your, your, your families expressed concerns, but those concerns were dismissed uh, with no offer of help support. And it, it, it dismissed, sir. It's quite a strong, uh, has quite a strong connotation. Just one that around, that, that, around that. I mean, in terms of how did they, how did the, the, the staff, the NHS staff, do you feel? Just by, they didn't even give his medication. Like when I was asking them, could you give his medication to ease his symptoms? They just dismissed that he was mentally unwell altogether. He wasn't suicidal. He wasn't mentally unwell. There was nothing wrong with him. He was a healthy man, according to them. So that's why I feel I was dismissed. 
I feel very strongly that it was dismissed, that Luke's concerns were dismissed, my concerns were dismissed, and it was dismissed. Okay, so just, just, just for, for clarification here, the, 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 the NHS stuff that you saw uh, did not recognise any That actually issues. became quite confrontational, see, when I was telling them my concerns. And I, come, <coughs> I, I came here from a background of nursing, so I've got some understanding of uh, mental illness. So I came out from that background and I've also came out that I've been assist trained and I've been safe talk trained. So everything that I learned in that training told me that there was severe warning signs there. And when I was trying to explain that to the staff, they just dismissed. I didn't know what I was talking about. Luke didn't know what he was talking about and he wasn't mentally unwell. And, and outside, of, outside of the um, Healthcare service. Are there are third sector organisations that, that could potentially help. Did, did you seek help from them, or did you get any feedback? Well, at them? that point in time, when I was researching, trying to find somewhere to help us, I couldn't actually find anywhere that was available at that point in time. I've since looked, Steph. I've found some amazing organisations. There's Farms. There's Chrissy's House. There is some amazing organisations out there, but I didn't know about them at the time, and that was something that I brought up. Um, at the, the suicide review, I brought up and asked, well, if the NHS staff couldn't help us, why didn't they point us in the direction to Chrissy's house, which is a, a, not even a mile away from where Wisha General actually is. So how could they not point us in the direction? And I get told that they don't endorse um, charities, um, that that's not something that they can advocate. That's a point. I, I, have a I was disappointed myself. <laughs> So I've got a constituent. The reason I ask is our constituency case exactly the same, and it's been difficult to find mm -hmm. the services, and there are fantastic services locally, and it's been difficult to actually point them in that mm -hmm. direction. So, can I, thank you, thank you very much. Richard Hamilton, Good morning, Karen, and, and thank you for telling us your story. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of the um, asks that you um, put into the um, petition, and one of them was that um, you felt the assessment tools are inadequate. Um, I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit, but also tell us whether you believe, since you've been speaking to Chris's house and fans, that actually um, they, they um, share the same views. I do feel that the assessment tools are lacking um, because in, in, the, in the, um, the investigation and stuff, uh, all the, the risk assessments were apparently carried out um, and they were all in place for Luke according to the NHS, but the assessment tools, they should have recognised that he was suicidal, just like I recognised he was suicidal, so they're missing key aspects, and the assessment tools are really lacking people, but some of the questions that they ask are very, they don't actually get to the root of the problem, they're, they're skimming about the issues, and the, 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 most serious, the most serious questions are getting missed, and they're not getting highlighted. And I think that's where the problem kind of falls. And the fact with risk assessments as well is it needs to be a generalised system so that if the, the social work, the health organisation, the justice the justice team, they're all putting their risk assessments into one central system. Right now, they've all got their own systems. So risk assessments that were carried out in look at previous years, it says he was a high risk, he'd gone to self-harm. Um, they were missed when we actually went to accident emergency, so that's where I'm talking about the assessment tools all need to kind of be looked at in a holistic approach. Okay. So, um, I mean, you're talking obviously quite a long uh, time um, frame here from when uh, Luke first um, was assessed, and you're clarifying that basically it, for A and E they'd seen those um, that risk assessment that perhaps they could have. Um, had more information, and that's what you're asking for. Yeah, some of the, like on the risk assessment that was particularly done for Luke at, at that time, um, I've seen, I've got his medical records, and I've went over it, and I don't necessarily agree with the answers that they've gave. Um, they said on it that he hadn't suffered, he hadn't suffered a, re a recent loss or bereavement, and that's not true. He'd lost somebody very close to him 13 weeks before he died. So that obviously had a massive impact and that was missed in his risk assessment. So the risk assessments need to be addressed and I think they need to be more kind of robust because when we 
when we were in that accident emergency room, there is no way he done a risk assessment in the time and Luke was in with him, because he was in maybe 10, 15 minutes. There is no way he's done a risk assessment. There's no way he's done a safe plan. There's no way they've done any of these kind of things. But what the nurses are doing is they're doing it after the patients leave, and I don't think that's good enough. I think they need to be done there and then. And the timing on, the, the timing on Luke's records when his risk assessments were done are a lot, a lot, a long time after from when we left accident emergency. Can I just ask one little question, uh, uh, Karen? You talked about Chris's house, and um, you found that uh, it, you know that you've you found that after um, Luke had sadly died. But when do you speak to other people in this cir these circumstances, and they say similar things about the assessments and about how they're not joined up together? A lot of organisations feel that the mental health system is failing. Um, I know there's a lot of organisations out there that has tried to get help, even like contacted um, patient services, trying to get patients help and they're feeling as if they're, they're feeling as if they're up against it as well it's not just kind of me that's feeling like this all the organizations out there are feeling the same that the assessment tools need to be looked at they need to be more robust and they need to be more patient centered as well it's it's very much it's still running off the nursing model and we need to get away from the nursing model it's doesn't work it's no work for years and we need to change and as other organizations are feeling the same way Thank you, Karen. Okay, um, Angus MacDonald. Yeah, thanks, convener. Hi, hi, Karen. Um, you, you've also said that you want to see a review of crisis support services outside office hours. Um, so I'm curious as to who you would want to carry out or, or be involved in such a review uh, and what, in your opinion, are the main issues that should be looked at? I think it needs to be Mental health services need to be available 24 hours a day. At the present time, majority of hospitals in Lanarkshire in particular, I know Hare Myers and Monklands, they currently don't have psychiatrists that sit in the hospitals after office hours, and particularly over like Christmas period and holiday period, it's a skeleton staff, so they, there's not the cut the the psychiatrists and stuff like that aren't as available as what they are through office hours. And I would like to see maybe a central hub set up so that it takes it away from accident emergency, that they're not everybody's not going to accident emergency be mental health, because going to accident emergency can be quite distressing for the person in itself, because um, they're experiencing all this torment going in. So sitting in a busy environment isn't the place. So it needs to be a central hub away from the hospital and somewhere be maybe a mental mental health nurses sit and you can go as a crisis um, and I think all crises need to be brought into that including drugs um, and drug psychosis and things like that as well I think there's mental health is so wide and the crisis is getting worse for all mental health aspects okay thanks <clears throat> certainly um, your, your suggestion of a central hub seems to be a a, a, an ideal solution and, and we'll make sure that's that's fed in um do, do you know of any um concerns that are shared by by others you know such as the mental health support groups that you mentioned earlier for example have they have you discussed I mean, they them? do certainly like chrissy's house they they're the first non-medical um 24-hour help help service that is out there so if they didn't feel that there was a need for that market they wouldn't be there. So they're there 24 hours a day. You can call them any t any time and they'll they'll give you support that way. So they've they've already started to go that way. They already feel that there's a central hub needed and it just needs to be wider spread throughout the full of Scotland and the full of Lanarkshire and it needs to be available. There needs to be consistencies through different health areas as well because a lot of things that other health boards do, NHS Lanarkshire doesn't do and there's no consistency from one health board to another, it's night and day. Even like going from your CAM services from Motherwell to Bell Sol is a massive difference. Like the, the some CAM services don't even take o, o, under over sixteens. They, they they shut you off, and then adult services don't take them on to eighteen. So there's a gap in the service there as well, where crisis help needs to be addressed. And of course, there's the issue with signposting that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. You know, 
you weren't aware of, of services? I feel if we were maybe signposted to places like Chris's House and Farms and some of the other amazing organisations out there, that could have maybe made a bit of a difference. That would have maybe been somebody for Luke to talk to. Maybe their, their opinion telling the, the hospital that, look, this man's genuinely unwell, maybe they would have listened better to somebody like that than listening to me, because they weren't listening to me. And they weren't listening to Luke, because Luke told them he wasn't well, Luke told them he was hearing voices, Luke told them that he wasn't sleeping, Luke told them that he needed something to help him, and they didn't listen to him, they didn't listen to me. So maybe an organisation like that they would have listened to. Yeah. OK, thanks, Karen. David Jones. Good morning, Karen. You have suggested that a fatal accident inquiry should be conducted if a person dies by suicide and has been in contact with mental health services in the previous three months. Can you expand on this, please? Yeah, well, I feel that the suicide review that got carried out with NHS Lanarkshire and then the complaint after that, didn't it was gathering the information. It didn't investigate what actually went wrong here. Where was Luke actually failed? Was it was it the assessment tools? Was it the staff attitude? Where was at, Where does the lessons need to be learned in this case? So I feel the only way to gather that information is a fatal accident inquiry. And I also feel that if somebody's been in, in contact with the services that close to their death, then definitely a fatal accident inquiry, because if somebody dies in prison, it's automatic, so how is it not the same? It should be the same consistency as if somebody's been in the care of the NHS and then went on and took their own life. And I feel that that's, that's kind of a big one for me as a fatal accident, because I feel as if, if a fatal accident inquiry takes place for Luke and David's case, then maybe lessons would be learned. Maybe if they started to learn lessons for previous suicide, it would save more people's lives. So I'd say the fatal accident inquiry is definitely a big one for me, and that's kind of one that I really want for a look as a fatal accident inquiry, just so that lessons are learned. Um, you put a time scale of three months on uh, the fatal accident inquiry, and I mean, can it be shorter, longer? What's your opinion on it? I would, I kind of just kind of said three months because I knew you wouldn't be able to say if they'd been in contact within the last year. That's unrealistic. So I think three months is maybe a bit uh, realistic, or even maybe a month. But Luke was, at, Luke was in contact with the mental health services the day before he died. We were at the, mental, we were at the addiction services on Thursday the, tw Thursday the 28th, and he took, his knife, he took his life at 2 o'clock that next morning. Before that, we were at, at the 27th, we were up at accident emergency. So that's for him to be in contact with the mental health services so close to his death and then going to take his life. I, I, I don't know why I feel accident inquiry hasn't been happened at kind of baffles me. I feel as if it should have automatically been done anyway, and that's kind of why we're here today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Good morning, Convener Committee. Karen, um, I'm, I feel quite um, privileged to be here today in support of, of Karen and Gillian Murray and the petition and their campaigning, and um, they're just both so courageous, and I'm, I'm just so full of admiration. In many respects, um, um, Karen's not just a constituent now, she's she's a friend, um, and I wish, I didn't know her so well, but um, I'm not as, as brave as Karen, but Karen emailed me, um, not for the first time, we'd been in touch about another issue, but um, during Christmas recess um, in 2017, um, my office was technically closed, my staff were on holiday and I was the person monitoring the the inbox and you joke that, oh well, you know, it'll be a quiet time and unless there's a, a flood or something locally, th there won't be much happening. Um, I checked my inbox very early on the the morning of the 30th of December, it was a Saturday morning and Karen McKeown had emailed me at 7.42am um, to inform me that that Luke had died at home by suicide. Um, so that was really the start of, of, of my journey working um, with Karen and, and her family. And I'm, I'm grateful to Karen's sister who's in, in the gallery today because I think without having immediate family support, I don't know how people can continue. And, and I think it is such an injustice that, that Gillian Murray can't be here today because she now is struggling with her own mental health and is experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. We, in my office, we've spent a lot of time with Karen. We've been in touch with NHS Lanarkshire. We've progressed the formal complaint and, and you know, the ombudsman and, and so on. 
And I'm aware that in Parliament and in government, there's, there's lots going on nationally in terms of different reviews and, and, and different strategies. But what Karen's talking about today um, isn't so much about legislative change. Partly it is about, about culture change. It is about the attitudes. And um, I know Karen won't mind me saying this, but having studied all the information about Luke's case and about Karen's experience, I think partly... The reason why Karen was dismissed by professionals is perhaps because she's a, a young working class woman, someone who's seen as just a mother, just a partner, who doesn't have um, the, the, the right insight, the right knowledge. And I think as Karen has shown very powerfully today, is that she's right. You know, if you um, love someone, if you live with a family member, you know that person inside out. She was able to see the changes in Luke's behaviour and knew his medical history. And I think the fact that we don't have integrated data, integrated health um, and, and care information shows that, that when there are those gaps, people fall through those gaps. So Karen's already touched on some of the points I wanted to make, and I'm grateful to members here for your very considered questions. I know, as a Central Scotland MSP, that, that even within Lanarkshire, there are inconsistencies. But as we know from Gillian Murray's testimony in Tayside, and I'm sure other members will know from their own areas, that there is inconsistency right across um, the, the, the country. Um, so I just want to, 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 to ask Karen, um, you know, given that you've been able to work closely with Gillian Murray and organisations like Chrissy's House that brought you into contact with other, other families, um, at a national level, we say people should ask once and they'll get help. Are there areas in the country that are doing this really well and are learning the lessons and we can look to that good practice? Or do we really need that national approach where we have to make sure that in terms of guidelines, in terms of um, the out-of-hours services that you've mentioned, that we really need to look at a wholesale approach? I would say... <coughs> From speaking to the people that's contacted me through my campaign, I've no kind of heard any positive um, feedback from the mental health service. But what I can say from my own experience with, with my son as CAMS, but from going from a, serv a service that, that said that it wasn't, um, that it didn't fit the criteria, and then going to a new service who is I honestly cannot fault the CAMS worker he's got at the minute. She's she's goes above above and beyond. She's really helping look. She's really there for for me and stuff like that. So I can't actually fault. So that is the only kind of good experience I've had. I would say out of everybody that's told me, I don't think there's any services that are actually getting it right, apart from the charities. Um, and there is some amazing charities out there, like Chrissy's House, Farms, and then in our local area, there is a new one um, that's just kind of opened up um, in the one of the local high schools. So there is some amazing charities. I would say that the charities are the best way to go forward because they're the ones that are actually out there pushing and campaigning and actually understanding the people because I don't feel as if the NHS are getting it. Can I pick up on the the question around the, the ministerial meeting that we had, I, I was with Karen at that, that meeting and we did have high hopes because it's it's great that Scotland does have a mental health minister. It's a dedicated role and the current minister is a mental health nurse herself with, with lots of experience in, in the health service. Um, I think it's fair to say, Karen, that you didn't ask for that meeting to have a cup of tea and, and to have more sympathy because there's, there's plenty of sympathy around um, what you were looking for um, was, was action. In, in the meeting, we discussed the fact that there is um, there are additional barriers when it's perceived that someone has a substance um, misuse addiction um, or that they actually do. And there's, there's different doors that people are, are sent to. And sometimes it's a case of um, you have to have your addiction resolved before you can access mental health treatment. Can I, can I just ask um, you to say, a bit more about that because when we've discussed it, um, you know, you've expressed that there, there is that disconnect. When we asked the minister about it, um, she advised that 
she was working on the mental health and suicide prevention side of it, and the public health minister was working on the addiction side of it. Um, how do you feel about that? I'd say the addiction side of it, the addiction side is, it caused a lot of problems, by Luke's case in particular, and I know it causes a lot of problems for other people because, as you said, the addiction has to be addressed before they'll deal with your mental health. Now, my opinion is, is addiction is mental health. If you take, yeah, you use a substance, whatever it may be, to black out from what's actually going on in your head. So it's just adding fuel to the fire. In Luke's particular case, Luke had actually stopped using substances three to four weeks before he died. So he had addressed, fair enough, it wasn't fully addressed, but he had addressed addictions issues. Um, and he had, he had no longer taking any substances when he in the time he died because in his toxicology report it came back with nothing in his system. So I'd say the addiction addiction side of things is causing a lot of hassle where people are saying you have to go to addictions, you have to go to addictions, you have to go to addictions. Well where's the crisis centre for addictions? Where's the crisis centre there? Where is the where is the pathway programme for people that's coming off people that's coming off cocaine? Where is the recognition that there is psychological effects, that there is withdrawal processes there, and it can lead to psycho that can lead to drug induced psychosis, which is a mental health condition. So although the addiction needs to be addressed, it does lead it is mental health and it does lead to mental health. And I think that needs to be addressed wider as well. So you've probably seen me back in a couple of months. <laughs> and you've talked about some of the attitudes that you've encountered and no doubt you know um you know many the majority of people working in our health services are, are, are very compassionate and um you know share the values of, of the nhs but there is a lot of stigma still around mental health but particularly around addiction um that 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 stigma do you feel that's still a barrier for people who are trying to access services certainly is um i think with the stigma that comes it, to say you're addicted to something people automatically assume that it's heroin or alcohol and I think that there's a wider range of addictions issues out there there's the legal highs that are in the up and the crisis that's going to come with that in the coming years is going to be phenomenal you've got the cocaine epidemic that it, you throw a stone and you'll probably find somebody that has either took it or has to, or still takes it and I think that these these side effects need the, these the effects of the, the addiction and the stigma surrounding it needs to end because it could happen to anybody. Mental health shows no discrimination, addiction shows no discrimination and everybody in any walk of life could be affected. And I think that's where the stigma needs to kind of get broke. It's coming from the kind of tap is be clear hockey. It was, that's not my issue, that's somebody else's. No, it's mental health, it's everybody's issue. It's, it's our country and if we want to make our country better, we need to start putting things into like mental health and addictions and education and all the other things that really need more attention rather than the pettiness that it's getting spent on. Can I just bring up another point briefly, convener? Um, Karen, as I said, emailed me in December, um, the 30th of December 2017, um, just before uh, New Year's Eve last year, so 2018, I had a, a, an email from another constituent in Lanarkshire from a, a father of a, a young man who's in his 20s. And um, I'm still haunted by Karen's email. I mean, I got this other email. There were echoes that felt very similar. And the reason why I wanted to mention that is because today the committee's touched on the fact that there are times in the year when people are more at risk. Um, Christmas can be a difficult time. And when services are winding down, um, for the Christmas holidays, um, it can be more difficult to get to get support. Um, on New Year's Eve, I basically had to doorstep NHS Lanarkshire and go down to their headquarters in Bothwell because um, this young constituent who had been discharged from hospital, um, again, Wishaw General actually, discharged in early December after a suicide attempt and he completed psychiatric assessment, which I think takes five, ten minutes, he ticks some boxes and, and he was discharged. Um, but um, I think it was the 29th of December, his, his father got in touch and they were very concerned and, and they thought he was at high risk of, of suicide. Um, when I went to NHS Lanarkshire, because they were having trouble getting um, access to the community substance misuse team, um, 
I was told that they were reluctant to give me the phone number for the community substance misuse team. It's a mobile phone number. And they were very concerned because um, the service is really overstretched and um, they were worried that they might get inundated with calls. So I promised that I would not advertise the phone number. That, 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 was, that was New Year's Eve. Um, and I was genuinely afraid. Um, I was worried that, that this young man, who I can't name because um, his family um, are going through hell, there's, there's drug addiction, there's alcohol addiction, and he's now going through the, the justice process. Um, but I was worried that he was going to be another Luke Henderson. So it does strike me that at that time of year, at Christmas and New Year, that's a particularly difficult time. Um, I just wonder, Karen, from your contact, your, your network now of, of people sadly affected by suicide across the country, is that a common experience at, at that time of year that it can be very difficult to get help? It's definitely very common um, because of the scale and staff that run over Christmas and New Year. It's not, they're not ruling at full capacity for nearly two weeks, sometimes a bit longer, depending on where the holidays fall and stuff. So it's definitely something that echoes throughout the full thing. Even I know how what I'm like at Christmas now and like Christmas past there it was horrendous, but I'm lucky enough that I have good family and I have my mental health does deteriorate at times, but I'm lucky enough that I can I'm are able to pull it out and I have got good supports, but no everybody's got that and it's definitely Christmas period there needs to be more support specifically around Christmas and the holiday periods. Thank you. And just one last tiny wee point, convener. Um, thank you for your, your patience. Thinking about, Karen, your own um, health now and, and, and Gillian Murray and people who have gone through this, there is work going on nationally and the Scottish Government are, are doing good work on this to make sure that all services are trauma-informed across the, the health service. Um, it can be quite difficult to go back into the GP practice to go back to, to a &E, to go back um, um, into hospitals when, when perhaps that's, you know, bringing up quite difficult memories and also you feel like you're having to answer all the same questions and sometimes there's a bit of judgment there. Um, is there any last point you'd want to make about how widespread training needs to be beyond just the mental health specialists? Is it everyone across the NHS that needs to be up in their game on this. I would definitely say that all 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 aspects of healthcare, specifically GPs, um, I think some of the GPs attitude, like what I some I went and tried to get myself a GP surgery um, and found myself in a middle of a full blown debate with a GP who told me that I had to go grow up. Now I feel that at that point in time I was not mentally too well at that point and I needed somebody to say to me right look this is what you need and try and I suppose calm me down a bit which a GP should do so I definitely feel that GPs and more healthcare workers have to be more advised on suicide and mental health and the awareness and stuff like that but GPs in particular needs to be more aware of how to handle patients and how to, how to recognise that somebody is in mental distress. Um, but I definitely feel that it has to be widespread. Okay, thank you. Can I ask, do you think that the problems were compounded by the fact that you had to go to A and E, where people, the staff, would, I mean, it's not to excuse any treatment, but under pressure, not specialists in, in terms of mental health. Do you see them being almost like a specialist A and E place to go if somebody's in crisis? That's what I would like to see happen, like a specialist. NHS place for crisis just for mental health because I feel that mental health is more important than physical health and getting them to go and sit there at an accident emergency where it's Friday and Saturday nights it's jam-packed sitting at the door when they're in that much torment that's no they need somewhere quiet secluded somewhere that they can go and offload and feel safe and secure no somewhere that's like too much kind of going on around about them important obviously then even if that were the case given your experience that there's information provided about how people get the, the help they need one last question i have and then i'll just check with other committee members have any final points um you'll know that this committee gets a lot of petitions particularly around mental health and very often um 
sadly, tragically uh, come out of tragic experiences. And, and you, like other petitioners, have shown amazing courage in that. But we know that there are, this is something that is you know, happening across our communities. You might be aware that the Minister for Mental Health was here a couple of weeks ago, um, and she had announced an independent overarching review of the Mental Health Act and other associated legislation. And I wonder whether, um, I know that you've, you've been sent the information, you may not have been able to look at it all yet. Do you have a view on that? And um, how do you think the issues that you've highlighted today should be played into that, that review, or can they be played into that review? I feel that it's good that the, the Minister's um, reviewing the legislation. Um, but in terms of that help and look, I don't know how changing legislation if, unless it's the, the fatal accident inquiry getting put into that. I don't know how that would kind of help in look specific case. Um, I've not really looked too much into it. I've read wee bits and I'll need to kind of look into it a bit more. But from what I've le read in the legislation changes, it needs to be more the policies and procedures that are actually in place rather than the legislation surrounding it. And I feel as if it's good to talk we can talk until we're blue in the face, but unless action starts happening, it's not going to change anything. And I was quite struck by this issue about seeing it as a public health issue around addiction and suicide around mental health, when I would have thought they do feel intertwined. I mean, logically, in our communities, anyone who's known anyone with an addiction, no, I don't pretend to understand addiction may come first and then mental health issues, but sometimes the addiction is a consequence of, of trouble in somebody's life as well. So I'm not quite sure how they can be divided off in that kind of way, but that's maybe something that we can pursue with the Scottish Government. I don't know if anybody has any final questions. Brian? Right? I've just got a, a, a point, really. Um, I think the, the story really resonates with me, I have to say, this idea of... Um, Difficulty to get your voice heard. Um, I, I, uh, I, I've, I've done this. I've um, gone with somebody who's quite close to me with their partner to a GP, with the person having uh, attempted suicide three times and likely of leaving that surgery without getting any kind of help whatsoever. And as a last roll of the dice, um, I said to the GP that if a uh, this person does succeed in taking their own life, I will make sure that everybody knows that I'd been in that GP surgery and raised this uh, with him. Now, that's, I'm not advocating that whatsoever. But it was only that, in, it was only in saying that the GP then agreed to, uh, to take some positive action. And I am absolutely convinced if I hadn't done that, that person wouldn't be with me today. And I know the impact that has had in me over a number of years, and that person is still here. So, uh, very brave of you, Garen, to come in and uh, give us your evidence. But you shouldn't need to go to that those lengths that I did to keep your uh, loved ones safe. And we know, we know, there's there's huge issues with uh, the pressures under the NHS. And we know that uh, an assessment by a GP is is, is subjective. But it does strike me that uh, the systems we have in place are not adequate to deal with the, 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 the continuing mental health uh, problems that we have. We see them through this committee almost every single, every single uh, month, and it's the same within the Health and Sport Committee. We have a system that, 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 that is under huge pressure and is broken, and somehow or other, we have to find a solution yeah, for this. Um, thanks for that, Brian. I think that, um, I mean, it's the issue of, our, of, of my generation, I guess, that, you know, that has come to the fore in a way that in the past it wouldn't have been really even spoken about. And that where there are lots of people in the system who are doing their best, there's something that's happening that's preventing the help getting to people when they, they need it, whether it's how they read somebody whether they're under pressure themselves, whether they're not trained in that in that field or whatever. I think it's a, a massive issue. I do think the fact the Scottish Government is reviewing the legislation is significant, but we should perhaps obviously be, in terms of that review, ensuring that what you say 
that what then comes out of that review is not just legislation that we all can be happy with, but the policies come um, behind that. I don't know if there's any last comments you want to make before we finish consideration. Just something that struck me what Brian said. One of the last things that I said to every person when I left that NHS, if anything happens to him, you as well hear me. <laughs> and by God, they're, they're hearing me now because I don't want to hear another case that their families have tried and begged. That this is this is a man that's lost his life. This is children that's grown up without a father. I, I'm going to grow old without him beside me, so I don't want anybody else to feel that pain. And I think that... I can just thank you for even giving me the opportunity and listening and just hope that something does come with this and it does save people's lives. Okay. And I think we would want to thank you because there's no doubt that you speaking out about your circumstances and forming the petition the way that you have done, you're speaking not just for yourself, you speak very powerfully for yourself and for your, for your loved ones, but you also, I think, speak to um, a broader community that need help as well. And we really appreciate that and we'd also think want particularly to put on record a thanks to Gillian, your co-petitioner, and hope that she is uh, able to make a recovery with the support of her family. We understand how difficult the pressures are on her. In terms of how we take this forward, um, I think I certainly think we want to write to the Scottish Government and perhaps some of the other key organisations that have been identified um, to seek their views on the action call for the petition, because I'm very struck that you have not just said this is what happened but this is what needs to change and I think there's quite a lot there that different organisations may want to respond to. Um, perhaps some of the organisations involved around mental health, I'm quite interested in t looking at this public health, mental health division which seems to be um, not helpful I don't think um, and perhaps you know, I don't know whether there's other organisations that people think that we could usefully Contact. Certainly Scottish Government, charities and groups operate in the field, perhaps the professional bodies, because it would be interesting if there's a view from um, psychiatrists and so on, do they see, that this, is this a feasible thing to have a hub which is almost the equivalent of A&E but is directing people out of the, what's often the chaos of an A&E &E department? Rachel? I'd like to work out um, the points that Karen made about the risk assessments and the collaboration of um, all the relevant uh, people who are making those assessments at the time and, and actually that probably is a um, sharing data issue and software data so um, if we could look at um, the best way to working out how that can be achieved. Okay, anyone else? Okay, I think we're agreeing that we want to take the petition forward in the terms, um, right in the Scottish Government and other uh, key people. Once we get a response from them, you will have the opportunity, along with your, uh, with Gillian, to respond to what comes in before our further consideration. Then, if you want to make a further submission at that point, you'll, you will be able to do so. But that would allow us to look at the extent to which you think people have responded to the asks that you've made within your petition itself. Um, and I think with that, can I again thank you very much, Karen, for, for coming along and thank your fellow petitioner, Gillian. Um, there's lots for us to think about from that petition. And with that, can I close this meeting?